I think I'm so passionate about this because I know the pain of not feeling seen or heard or acknowledged by the people who love or claim to love me the most. And it's mm -hmm. heartbreaking and it's devastating. And it induces that out of integrity emotion of me, which is wanting to yell, which when I'm yelling, mm -hmm. I've, I'm upset. But if I've been pushed to that limit um, without shaming or blaming anyone, including myself, something is completely out of alignment there. Are you going through life blind? This is Eyes Wide Open with Nick Thompson. On this podcast, we share knowledge and stories that build human connection while elevating stigmatized societal issues such as mental health, holistic wellness, culture, free speech, and more. All to ensure we show up in the world with our eyes wide open. Welcome to a new episode of Eyes Wide Open. Our guest today is Kate Ekman. Kate is the host of the Raw-ish podcast. She's a broadcast journalist and author of the best-selling book, The Full Spirit Workout, which is a 10-step system to shed self-doubt, strengthen your spiritual core, and create a fun and fulfilling life. I'm not done now. She's also a keynote and TEDx speaker and a certified executive coach. Thank you for coming on today. How are you? I'm so happy because I'm here with you and I almost just wish everyone could hear the conversation we just had before we oh hit record. God. It was so epic. <laughs> it, that is the best part. The best part. I actually feel a lot of times like the best part of the conversation happens before I record, especially when you're kind of just getting to know someone. And I know we talked a couple of weeks ago, but just getting to know you a little bit, it's kind of like we could just ramble on and on and on and on in a conversation and not even record anything. Yeah. And you even got to see this other Raj side of me or just had a, a disruption at the house. And it is that flexing the muscle of when people do not respect boundaries. And, but I think it's good to show that, that side of ourselves and then also how we move through disruption or chaos or uncertainty or yes. frustration. That's really important. Yeah, you're exactly right. I was actually just talking to my friend today about um, how, like I get, when I get irritable, I like resort back to this younger version of myself that was always pissed off about everything. And I've got to like, realize like, it's actually like my irritability. It's, it's the things that are making me irritated or stressing me out. I'm not actually this like hothead that's going to lose their shit every time something goes wrong. So it's a good reminder to kind of be like, all right, sometimes we just got to take a step back, take a deep breath and know that we are not that person that maybe other people are, are how they're impacting us. I think also it's important that we learn to stop judging ourselves so harshly or gaslighting ourselves and that our anger is, is a gift and mm. it shows us where our values are, are being compromised and it shows us where our boundaries are being overstepped. And so I think it's, we can learn from it. And for me, I'm trying to get to a place where I never under any circumstances, unless I'm being like physically attacked or something, have to scream or raise my voice because the person isn't listening. Oh, yeah. But I, I think I think we need to let ourselves off the hook a little bit or just say, okay, or this bothers me. It's not even so, yes, this situation is upsetting, but it, it goes back in, in, in my case to not feeling heard as a child mm -hmm. or in some relationships. And so- you're like, okay, they're not hearing me. Let me try again. Mm, still not hearing me. In fact, they're even resisting and pushing back and ignoring. So then we're even more inflamed. And yes. so it's like, oh, it's just a natural human instinct. Even the lions are roaring, you know, to get your attention. It's like, oh, I guess I have to yell or scream for this person to hear me, which we know that doesn't work either. No. And that reminds me some of my childhood too, where it would just be people trying to scream louder than the person before them. <laughs> it's, it's just yeah, not a good way to communicate, but it, it is when people like don't want to hear you. It is very frustrating. It, it gets, I, I get particularly frustrated when someone doesn't want to hear me and then consequently also talks to me. Like, I don't know what I'm talking about because I'm actually, I don't speak very often unless I know the topic or unless I'm knowledgeable, or it's about something that I personally feel or believe in. And so when, when you're kind of coming at communication or something you are sharing from a place of knowledge, expertise, it's just how you're feeling and people don't see you and people don't hear you and people don't acknowledge that, that is, that is where I hit my tipping point and then I'm yelling. <laughs> yeah. And I think sometimes it's, it's healthy. I think 
I think the aftermath of it, at least for me, is then I I feel bad because we don't I don't want to yell at anybody, myself mm -hmm. or anybody, whether I care about the person or not. It it never feels good. And then it's like we've kind the of guilt. stooped to their low vibrate their low vibration. And right, it's it's that guilt, it's that shame, it's I know better, I'm more mature than this, I'm more emotionally intelligent than this. But again, I think it goes back to that self-compassion and grace and just like we'll see how we handle it next time. But um right. It, it is. I think we that. all need to give ourselves that hug because life is is challenging and we're managing so much. I don't even think we we realize the full scope of the stuff that we manage mm -hmm. or micromanage or macromanage on a daily basis. And we're also exhausted. And I don't think we're really talking about how exhausted we are. And I don't even think just like I'm exhausted because I worked a 12 hour day. We're exhausted mm -hmm. from the insanity of the world. And then An over stimulus. The Yes. And then those can like, it's creating that in other people. So when you go to have a meaningful or calm or loving interaction with someone, they're not even capable or, or available for that based on all the caca of the world that we're talking about. I couldn't agree more. I find myself like sometimes the most simple to do is the hardest because I'm just like, I have so much going on in my head and so much going on around me that I'm I'm looking at like, send this email as a Mount Everest climb, because I think we're all so overstimulated. And we've, we've got social media, we've got text messages, we've got, you know, we're the channels of communication and information coming at you, you don't even have much control over anymore, right? Because you're getting social notifications, text messages, phone calls, emails, personal emails, work emails, uh, Teams chats, Slack chats, Zoom calls, Teams calls, people messaging you um, through WhatsApp. And I mean, it's just, if you stop and think about the channels that people have access to you and you don't even necessarily have control over it sometimes, like I know I shut off all my social media notifications. That was a game changer, but like, I can't stop someone from texting me. I can't stop someone from messaging me at work or sending an email. Like I looked on on my emails earlier today and I was in a one hour meeting, I came back to 22 emails and it's like, what the hell's going on, you know? And so it, you know, then it's like shifting your mindset is exhausting as well. Cause you're using different parts of your brain in work in, you know, doing something like this or communicating with your friends or your family. And it's just, it's just so much information and our minds aren't built through evolution to handle what's happened to the way we communicate in the last like 20 years. It's just all happened so fast. Yeah. And I think it's important that we talk about this. I think the first step in overcoming any problem or solving any problem is first acknowledging that there is a problem um, and admitting I am worn out. I'm burnt out. I'm overwhelmed. I'm exhausted. I'm no longer willing to put up with this or whatever that truth is for ourselves. And then rather than dwelling there, we first have to acknowledge it and talk to a trusted friend, coach, therapist, mm -hmm. um, and I, I and not just ourselves and, and stuff it down because that's what I did. What do we do? We stuff it down with food, alcohol, drugs, sex, shopping, whatever your vice is. So talking about it and then doing what we're doing, you know, showing up for each other, creating a space for whomever is listening to really show up for themselves and maybe at dinner tonight, instead of talking about what's for dinner or, you know, what the kids did at school or who's going to pay the bills, maybe start with a deeper, more meaningful question to then for, therefore have a deeper, more meaningful conversation, but start admitting these things and like, okay, what am I going to do about this? Okay. I'm going to turn off my notifications. I'm going mm -hmm. to take every Friday afternoon off. I'm going to, whatever your thing is, start journaling. But I find yes. even, you know, we had a frustration right before, we hit record and then, you know, thank you for just, we talked about it for a minute and I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm good. Because as my coach says, when I used to say to her, I, I would say, I'm so frustrated. And she would say, you get to be. And then once someone tells mm. me that I get to be frustrated, I think, why well, don't have to be frustrated anymore? But what do most people do to us? They say, oh, just get over it. Let it go. It's not that big of a deal. Who cares? Or they might even say, I'm sorry, that sucks. But <clears throat> I think when we just allow ourselves and allow others to just feel whatever we're feeling in the moment, we can move through it really quickly. I think you're spot on with that. And the validation that um, you know you you get from that. And, and, and I had something last week. I remember I was very angry about it. I actually popped a blood vessel in my eye because mm -hmm. I, I think I was just, and I don't get 
angry very often anymore. Like I'll get frustrated and irritable, but, but I, I like popped the blood vessel in my eye. It looked like someone popped me in the eye. And I just remember I like, I walked in to my therapist and I was like, I'm like really fucking pissed about this. And this is really frustrating me and like sitting with me. And she's like, well, that's okay. That's a totally normal thing to be angry about. And I just felt I let it go within minutes of after that. And so it is true. And I think too, like a lot of times when we have negative emotions, um, I don't, you know, I, I know I isolate, I withdraw and isolate because I don't want to put that on other people. And I think that's, that's toxic. Like that's not a good way to be. If you're frustrated and angry, like find someone you can be frustrated and angry with, that's going to help you feel validated and give you space to like talk about it and get it out instead of balling it up inside and waiting for it to grow when something else pisses you off. Yeah. And I, I think even the most well-intentioned parents, they weren't taught about emotional regulation. They weren't taught to talk about feelings or, or just happy. It's like happy is the only thing that we should all be or aspire to. Otherwise there's something quote unquote wrong with us wrong with and, you. and yeah. how beautiful our sadness is and our anger and our grief and to be able to feel those things and feel the full spectrum of emotions. And I think that's another inspiration behind the, the show that I've created Raish because I want to have us all experience raw emotion and talk about these things that makes us healthier people, deeper, yes. richer people. And these emotions need to live outside of the body instead of stuffing it down or, you know, everyone's pretending they've got it all together or, or everything's fine. And we're just sucking it up to get through the work day or to show up in our marriage or as parents, rather than taking even five minutes to reflect on how upset we are, reflect on, okay, this marriage isn't working, reflect on, mm -hmm. I do need to leave this job, or I do need to move, or I do need to establish healthier boundaries, regardless of how much it disappoints people. So while you and I aren't, aren't doctors or therapists, I feel like we have the, the street credit <laughs> experience, the experience and to talk about this. And I, I hope whomever is listening is just able to let themselves off the hook to see themselves and feel validated and, and our feelings or frustration. And we were even talking about, you know, I locked myself out of the house the other day. Cause I think I was just we're trying to do too much and we're going mm -hmm. too fast. And I feel like all the mistakes I've made in my life are, are when I was going too fast. And so slowing down, Ooh. taking a breath, breathing, taking a pause. After you listen to this, I hope you can even take two minutes to just sit and stare out the window, reflect on what we said, reflect on how you're feeling and check in with yourself daily and ask, how are you doing? How are well, you it's doing? Funny. It's funny you say that because I was walking yesterday. Um, I, I go on a lot of walks. It's kind of how I meditate and decompress. And um, last night I was walking and I, I don't know why I thought about this. Um, I don't even remember what I was listening to, but I remember that like I have someone that would, that that's whole philosophy online is onwards and upwards. And I was thinking to myself, I'm like, you know what? That's actually kind of bad that onwards and upwards when something bad happens is not acknowledging that something bad happened and that that person's allowed to sit in that negativity or that pain or whatever. And the reality is our emotions are what make us human. That is the human experience. And we have unfortunately created a society over decades and decades and hundreds of years where emotions, especially, I mean, they're almost based by like, by, by your identity or your sex or whatever, right? Emotions, um, they're the human experience and we need to be allowed to feel them, one, without guilt, and then two, express them so that someone can acknowledge you and make you feel less alone. And I think that with, as you were saying, every, everybody's, you know, so happy or puts that out there or wants to put that out there. And the reality is, is like we live in this moment in time where everything's a highlight reel on social media or a highlight reel on TV or whatever it is. And the reality is, is like no one's sitting there talking about, you know, what's on your mind today? What's top of mind today? And that's something that I actually, um, you know, with this this new season of the podcast, I'm going to start asking people that. And first, I do want to go back and ask my favorite question to ask people, but I want to ask people like, what's top of mind right now? So I'm going to, I'm going to ask you that, like what's top of mind for you right now today? Connection, communication, empowered communication, assertive communication, 
owning our our voice and our power, um, not in a mean spirited way, not in a controlling, manipulative way, not in a way to to hurt anybody, but um, feeling confident enough to own our truth and and mm -hmm. speak it and say it with kindness because. The truth said without kindness is violence. I didn't come up with that. I heard it from my mentor, Marianne. And I, I think that's important, tone and delivery. And like I said, not getting to the place you're having to scream to be heard. But, you know, we were talking to about my TEDx talk and it was centered around confidence. And I've done so much research on it. And I love that topic, the inner confidence. And then I got off that stage and it was kind of like, what's next? That's the Aquarian in me, the future thinker, the alien. It's always what's next, but take a moment yep. to, to pause and enjoy that moment. Good job, you did it. Okay, and then what's next? But just with my personal and professional life, I think, wow, to be a grown adult and think that my next mission or the next thing I need to do to uplift the world is to teach adults how to communicate and how to connect. It's my favorite thing to talk about right now I'm so grateful that people like you exist because you are such a um, exceptional communicator and you really do know how to connect even through a screen to a, a stranger that we were a few weeks ago. And it is a gift and even a skill and talent. And so let's teach people how to do this because and people are like, oh, I don't have time for that. But everyone I know <laughs> wants to make more money, perform at a higher level, all of those things. It's like, well, when you can communicate and connect uh, more effectively, literally everything that you could yeah. ever desire will come to you a lot quicker and and a lot with a lot more ease. And I think you're spot on. And it makes me beg the question, like, where did we go wrong where people don't have time for communication? They don't have time to explore the human connection that you can build with people. Um, you know, we're just go, 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 connect through your phone, all those channels I mentioned earlier that you can communicate through, uh, be available, or at least perceived available at the snap of a finger when someone decides and we don't take the time to connect human to human anymore. And, and I think that's kind of like a unfortunate thing that's been escalated the last few years and escalated with social media and escalated with zoom calls or the ability to record in a virtual studio like this, where it's great because you get to connect with people you otherwise wouldn't be able to, but it's also creating sort of this normalization that the human connection isn't, isn't like needed in the same way that it was prior to video. Yeah, I, I find even with some people I've worked with, it's it's okay, I'll 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 take your bone that you're throwing at me and, and get better at communication or connection only if you can prove that it'll make me 10 times more money this year. Or it's everything's about this this bottom line. And yeah. and then I my next question is so you don't you think you would make more money if you learn to communicate effectively to sell your product or service and aren't people more likely to buy your product or service if they feel a connection with you if they see themselves in you if you're talking about pain points or you just you make people feel like they matter there is this mm -hmm. you know gazillionaire in new york city that i met kajak and he um launched um Intermix, the fashion retailer, when he was 19 years old, he's a hmm. genius and had that level of success, you know, $100 million as a teenager. And he opened this incredible meditation space that sadly closed during COVID called Inscape. Uh. And what I, I learned from Kajak, who multimillionaire lives in his $50 million penthouse in Tribeca, so has all the material success and kind of dresses down, you would never know it based on looking at him. But what I learned from him is the importance of when he had this launch going up to each person and and like even to me, like, hi, what's your name? And you have given me a compliment. You have such an incredible presence. Here's a free candle. Thanks for coming. Took the time to connect with me. And he says he even walks into these business meetings with hedge funds and stuff and people they they think he's in the wrong place because he's you know just because he's just so cool he's so one of us and so it's just and even I learned that from Tom Cruise when I was an entertainment reporter it was the that last Samurai premiere in Westwood there were three hundred media outlets there from all over the world that movie was two and a half hours the movie was over the screening was over most of the red carpet was rolled up the lights were turned off he was still out on the red carpet insisting on talking to every reporter who showed up that night that's respect I, that's respect from him he didn't have to do that he's not no. going to make a penny more doing that it doesn't really matter what you think of him he's still commanding his you know box office uh, salary so 
I just think that it, it, it matters. And again, what kind of legacy do you want to leave to the world? Is it just, you know, how much money you made, how many people knew you or didn't know you, but how do you want people to feel in your presence? It matters because that directly affects how you're going to feel in your own presence. You're so right. I'm glad you brought that up actually, because what this was a several months ago. Now I had someone on my, my show here and she was talking about legacy and I'd never thought of it in the same way you're presenting it, which is what do you want people to remember you for? And it goes to the, the, also the old adage of people don't remember what you said. They remember how you made them feel. And I think those tie so closely together. And I know for me, one of the most important things of how I want to show up in the world is I want to make people feel safe with me. I want to make people feel like they can talk to me about anything and that they can reach out and feel supported. Or, you know, it was, it, it happens not as much anymore, but people still recognize me when I'm walking, you know, around or I'm out somewhere or something from the show. And it's funny because nine out of 10 times I'll, I stop and talk to everyone, right? If they want a picture, I'll take a picture, or whatever. But nine out of 10 times they're like, at the end, they're like, oh my God, you're so nice. You're so normal. And I'm like, I'm literally just a normal guy. And if you want to talk to me and say hi, like I'm going to say hi, because I'm not a, an asshole, right? And that's something that I, I, I find heartwarming to hear that, you know, I am making people feel better when I talk to them, even if it's from like a different uh, perspective, like someone who knows me from the show. Because yeah, what think, are we doing otherwise? What are, what, are, what are we doing? And we all have to look at ourselves in the mirror. And if you're a sociopath or psychopath, uh, you know, it, it doesn't matter for you. But most of us aren't that. And if you are that, I, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I'm sure you're not listening to Nick's show. <laughs> <laughs> They'd be hate listening. <laughs> but but I, I think it matters. But first, we have to really cultivate that relationship with ourselves so that we have the capacity to fully see and hear others and, and really show up for them. And I think that's what we're seeing now after COVID and, and with, with tension in the world. And, you know, you can feel it. And especially depending mm -hmm. on what city you live in, the air is thicker than others with the tension or the hatred or the, the stress and, and the fear. It's just, I even feel it in myself. And sometimes it's warranted, like crime is up and things like that, but it's that fear that you you feel. Yeah. And so it, it is up to us to to do the practices and to do the inner work to really uh, stay finely tuned. We are instruments and, and stay finely tuned on the inside so that we can play our, our instrument for the, wor the world. And that's why I think a lot of people have had relationships, friendships, romantic family relationships fall off because they either simply don't have the capacity to show up for others in a meaningful way anymore or maybe ever or because they can't even show up for themselves effectively, yes. or they just realize they're no longer a match for some people because I think our tolerance for the bullshit has just decreased so much that it's just like, I, I cannot go to lunch with somebody who can't even ask me how I'm doing, or right. I guess doesn't care. What is the point? Well, I think that goes to the, back to the connection thing. And one, um, you know, I, I, you, you know, I'm, I work in marketing. I'm a leader. I have a team of people that work under me or for my team. Right. And one of the things that I share with people through, you know, one-to-one -one interaction or something is ask people questions. Like you would be amazed at the connection you can make with someone and how quick you can make it. If you ask them a question Ask them how they're feeling about something. Ask them what's top of mind for you today. What's keeping you up at night? What are you, what are you struggling with? And listen, and then repeat it back to them using the words they use, you know, and, and that can build a connection so quickly and then make sure that person receives, or uh, I'm sorry, returns it back to you as well. And one thing, you know, this goes back to, to like, my experience on the dating app several years ago before I like will never go on them again. It's <laughs> <laughs> I used to have this rule where if they didn't ask me a question back about myself in three messages, I was done because okay. that's not someone that's interested in getting to know me. That's not someone who's in the same wavelength as I am on how you should be dating and how you should be interacting with people. So why would I keep that person in my space? It just doesn't make any sense. But I think, I think we're so, connected. We're so 
invested. We're so available, even when we're not available, right? We're, we're available. And it just, it forces us to kind of get this like fatigue, this decision fatigue, this mental fatigue, where we can't even take a moment to reflect on ourselves and say, what's going on with me? So there's no way you're going to show up and be able to ask what's going on with somebody else. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I think I'm so passionate about this because I know the pain of not feeling seen or heard or acknowledged by the people who love or claim to love me the most. And it's mm -hmm. heartbreaking and it's devastating. And it induces that out of integrity emotion of me, which is wanting to yell, which when I'm yelling, mm -hmm. I, I'm upset. But if I've been pushed to that limit um, without shaming or blaming anyone, including myself, something is completely out of alignment there. And we, it's a gift because we can, you know, do, do some work, but whether it's the, the checkout person at the grocery store or my best friend or a client or a colleague or my neighbor, whether it's two seconds or two hours, I really want you to feel seen and heard and acknowledged in my presence and acknowledge people like, Hey, I, I saw that podcast that you did about elephants in the wild. It was so good. And here's what I liked about it. That's going to mean so much. Cause you're like, wow, you took the time to listen to my show. You're telling me something you liked about it. You're acknowledging me or, Hey, you tell me something upsetting. And instead of being like, that sucks, just even, gosh, I'm so sorry. That sounds so frustrating. What did you learn about yourself? Or, you know, how will you show up different? Yeah. Like maybe ask a question back to get you to reflect and move through it or just even pause with that person. And I'm like, I'm so sorry. I know you've gone through so much. I also know how strong you are and you're going to get through it. What would be helpful for us to discuss right. right now? Do you want to talk about this or would you rather talk about this exciting opportunity you have coming up? That is the key. Asking the person who you're supposed to be supporting what they need in that moment. And that can be so many things, but instead of like, projecting your opinions or your advice. And I'm guilty. I'm a fixer recovering where I always want to throw some advice out there. I've got some thoughts on how you can get more out of this. But like the reality is, is a lot of times people don't need that. They just want someone to tell them it's going to be okay. They just want someone to listen to them, explain how they're actually feeling. Cause that's hard to do. And you have to, you got to be patient with someone, but asking someone what they need from you in that moment. And by the way, words and phrasing matter. There is, let me know if I can do anything and then let, or um, tell me how I can help you or tell me how I can support you. So like just being um, uh, careful with your words and choosing the words that are actually inviting and not off-putting like, okay, I'm going to head out. Let me know if you need anything or it, versus, okay, I'm going to head out. I'm here for you. Let me know how I can help you. It's just very, it's very different. Yeah. And I, I think um, something that could see like so many things came to mind when you were talking, but yeah, as you were talking, what, what came to mind for me is really how, how simple it is to connect with someone. We think it's this big challenging thing, but for instance, the other day never happened to me, but my, my car battery died. So my car wouldn't start and it's luckily it happened at my house. So I was safe, but it's still that feeling of, oh gosh, did I do something wrong or what happened or what's wrong with my car? I just had it serviced. And the guy came to, to help me out and he did something, which is, you know, really all that any of us need. He's like, I got you. It's going to be okay. I've been doing this 20 years. I got you. And I'm yeah. like, okay, I'm fine. I'm safe. Because I think underneath all of our aggravation or any emotion is uh, this feeling of, am I safe? Whether it's like physically yes. on a dangerous street or emotionally safe to share my heart with you. And are you going to reject me or, you know? And so I just, with anything, just let people know, like, I've got you, or you call me sobbing right now for whatever reason, like, Nick, I may not have all the right answers now, but I've got you. I'm here for you. Um, you know, let, I think also asking people before, cause you know, we all want to solve problems for people, mm -hmm. but sometimes I've had to say to people, I don't need any advice. I, I I'm not looking for you to solve my problem. I just need to share with you what just happened because I'm really upset. Like, can you just hold space and listen? And do you have the time right now? Cause you might say, Oh my God, I would love to. And yes, I can do that. I'm getting on zoom in two minutes with a client and I have yeah. to be fully present. So can I call you in an hour? And I will say yes. And I will be so grateful rather than you're like, you just need to do this or you need to tell them to F off. And like, you don't yeah. put up with that. So before we give people feedback, ask them, do you want feedback? And the person might say no. And, and especially from 
from you because maybe you're not a woman and you haven't been through that. Or maybe like, I only mm -hmm. need medical advice and you're not a doctor. So it is, it is easier than we think. It's just these little fine tuning phrases or um, capacity to listen that is so effective. And being intentional with your response. I think we're all so quick to react. And, you know, the other thing, we're also quick to react. We should be more intentional with how we respond and we should be responsive, not reactive. I, I find that one thing that's been helpful to me is I now think about everything as we all have a, we're all a snowflake, right? We're all looking and experiencing the human experience through a individual one in an infinite amount of glasses. And that's how we all view the world. And so what I mean by that is what's important to me right now is maybe not important to somebody else. And maybe somebody else has something that's more important to them right now that isn't even on my radar. And that person in that moment has tunnel vision to only see what that is. Or I have tunnel vision right now to only um, do this podcast recording with you. But that is that perspective is going to has helped me really kind of stop and first say, okay, just because someone else needs something right now, I don't have to stop what I'm doing to give that. But it also gives me the perspective of when someone else needs something, you should give them, if it's, you know, a friend or whatever it is, or a coworker, even you should give them that type of response as well, which is like, I can't do this right now, but here's my alternative solution for you. Because if we, part of the reason I think we get so fatigued is because as I said earlier, we're available on all these channels all the time, 24 seven, and we're always stopping one thing, doing another, stopping one thing, doing another, and we don't take time to focus on anything. And when we take time, that time to focus and we still acknowledge people, that's when you can actually start to, to kind of like clear space for people because you're not, you're not having the space occupied by your to-do list or whatever you have going on emotionally or, or mentally. And you're, you know, you're not letting the other people come in and sort of um, dictate the way that your, your thoughts and mind is, is working in the moment. Yeah. And I think just to be fully present and, and, put yourself in the shoes or the perspective of the other person. And maybe, you know, I'm so upset because the, the Uber driver showed up an hour late and I'm like, I have to get to the airport three hours early and I'm freaking out. We're going to miss our flight. And maybe you're like, that is not a big deal to you. You're happy the Uber's late because you like to show up at the airport last minute and just walk on the flight. But you know, you're like, oh, you know, Kate's my friend. I know that's important to her. So if I'm like, Nick, I'm freaking out. Rather that well, a lot of people make us feel crazy, make us feel mm -hmm. like we're high maintenance, make us feel like we're difficult, make us feel like there's something wrong with us, but it's just our, our preference. And so just saying like, hun, I know that this is really upsetting to you, but um, let me call another car service. I know it's important to you to get there on time. Or, you know, I just checked with Delta. We're still going to be two hours early. I got you. Um, let me go make you some chamomile tea just to calm your nerves. But I think even you just not judging me, first of all, right. and just being like, I Great stating, point. I know this is really important to you. I've got you. I promise you we're going to get there on time. And if for some reason we miss our flight, I already checked with the airline. There's a flight leaving an hour later. And I'm like, thank you so much. And then I don't even care about the flight or any of that. I just am like, I'm, I'm taken care of like you. And you let mm -hmm. me know that like, what's important to me is also important to you. Not because you care, but because I care. I, that I think might be the secret to successful relationships, by the way, um, is, is the two people coming together is never going to be flawless. In fact, it, it would be crazy if it was flawless. Right. But when you, uh, I think you hit the nail on the head when you sit there and you care about what your person cares about, not because you care personally, but because you care about them, it can be such a game changer it can really bring people together. And, and, you know, I know in, in the past I've done things, um, experienced things, watched movies or shows that I have no interest in watching or, or experiences I have no interest in experiencing personally, but like, watching my partner experience it or experiencing it with them has been very rewarding and very 
very connection building. And I think that's something that we all lack because everybody is, you know, again, looking at the world through their own point of view, which is fine. There's no other way to do it. That's how everyone's going to do it. But when you look at it in a way and you experience it in a way where you don't, you don't react. Again, it's like the react response. You don't react and you don't put your experience on someone. You can really connect with them in a, a whole different level. And that just, that's not just partners. I think that's, you know, people at, at work, that's people in your life. That's your, your um, neighbor. That's your uh, person that drives you crazy at work. Like you can really build connection if you just take the time to stop reacting to the way that you see the world and your view of the world. Yeah, and and, and case in point today, why I, I got so upset right before we were recording by something that happened at, at the house is people that just show up unannounced. And maybe if you've got nothing going on, it's not a big deal, but it's still um, a level of, of disrespect. And it doesn't matter if the person who, um, disrespected your boundary thinks it's a big deal or not it's a it's a big deal to you so i think it's important mm -hmm. that we we stop gaslighting ourselves um as well and stop judging and blaming ourselves or like wow i really i reacted instead of reflected and sometimes we don't have the the patience or we're not enlightened buddhas we're still flawed beautifully flawed humans where we still are reactive but it does become a practice and and the work that i do but i think sometimes just from a, a um you know evolution perspective it's even like someone it's like if someone's about to like run over you you're screaming and yelling like stop and i think mm -hmm. that's what happens when people are emotionally about to run us over or like you know our physical boundaries are being disrupted i think sometimes it's just an act of of self-protection and, and preservation and so you know as long as we can learn from it and and talk about it but um you know, something that came up for me in, in dating recently too, that it went way over the person's head and it, it felt so foreign. And I'm like, why is this so foreign? Whereas like, and I'll tell you what it is in a second, but where the playing games and let me wait a certain amount of time before texting or texting back and, ooh, be complimentary, but too complimentary because you don't want them to have a, a big head or feel a certain way. And I, what I like to say to people, um, you know, let's say you and I just start dating and we're long distance and it's a, a, a texting thing. And I would say to you and, and really whatever you think you think, cause it would show me if we're a match or not right, right yeah, away. Completely. But I would say to you, Hey, what are your texting preferences? What would make you feel really good and really safe and really loved in a relationship with me as it relates to communication and texting? Do you want me to text you every morning when I wake up and say something funny or just, you know, say good morning? Do you not want me to text you until noon, for instance? And these things mm -hmm. may sound silly, but you hear a lot of people freak out about like, it's noon and I haven't heard from him or, you know, he doesn't call me every day. So I think if we just communicate those things up front, even if people think we're weird or needy or something, but that's a sign too. If someone thinks we're needy for requesting that they call me every day, then we're not a match. And how great that we know now rather than months down the line. You are spot on with that. And I think that that's being intentional, right? And um, I think uh, to elaborate my, my point of view on that, which is very similar to yours, and I would just add a kind of like a, a little cherry on the top of it is when we know what we want and we know what we need in a relationship, it is very, very easy to spot the, let's say the overused term red flags. And just because you're seeing a red flag, that's a red flag for you, right? So if you see someone who texting preferences or calling preferences don't align with you and there's no equal medium that you can meet at. And for example, I'm someone that doesn't like to talk on the phone. I don't like to talk on the phone for pretty much two reasons. One, I'm on the phone all day for work or a Zoom almost all day for work every day. I do the podcast, right? I do, um, um, uh, uh, what's, gosh, brain fart myself now. Oh, I do, <laughs> you know, I'll like, I'll have um, calls for work. I'll have calls for, um, you know, my, my UCAM foundation, I'll be doing this all day. And at the end of the day, like, I don't want to talk anymore. Sometimes I physically can't talk anymore because my throat's so dry, you know, like literally that happens to me. And so it, it's one of those things where it's like, yes, I actually will make an effort to talk on the phone, but like, I also need that person to make the, 
have the understanding that like, I can't do it every day. Like I just don't have the, the brain power. And so I think like people have to meet in the middle on stuff and, and everything isn't, so my point on that, everything isn't a red flag, but what you can do is start to figure out what you need in a relationship. And then when you have those things, you figure out what isn't that important and what you just let slide away or learn to love about that person or, or understand that's a key personality trait, but then recognize what are deal breakers for you. And when you spot a deal breaker, don't be afraid to walk away. Yeah. And I, I think in, in, your, in your case in point, and let's say for me, I'm like, no, I need for whatever reason to talk to that person every day. And you're like, I'm not available for that. Some people and very uh, rigid in their ways, I'll be like, well, that, that's we're not a match, then it's not going to work. Where I would argue, especially because all relationships, especially our rom romantic relationships, they are assignments. They are here for our evolution, for our soul growth. No one's going to trigger you like your romantic partner, not even your parents. And so <laughs> if you look at it like that, and so if you said that to me, if I'm like, I really, for me to feel really safe and loved in a relationship, I need that daily connection on the phone. And you're like, I, for those reasons, which I respect, not able to give you that I would then, for my own self revolution, would say, well, instead of like, this isn't the right person, well, how about this is the right person? Because in, like, instead of needing that every day, that time I'm not on the phone with them, I can be on the phone with a friend or go to dinner with a friend. I can go to yoga and connect with myself. I can journal. I can do another activity so that you, when we do connect, mm -hmm. have the capacity to show up more fully for me. You're not resentful. You're not irritated your boundaries and wishes are being respected. And then I can learn to meet my own needs so that the relationship is not about what can Nick give to me, rather what I can give to Nick. And then that feels really good to you. So you're thinking, gosh, my needs are met. What can I give to Kate rather than what exactly. can I get from Kate? Is everybody following me? And I may sound like a foreign alien because I am, but it's like, what if this was our thinking? And what if we could always see it as, ooh, this makes me feel insecure where from a spiritual perspective, what a gift to work through my insecurities so that I can be a more secure partner to yeah. myself and my partner. Yeah, you are spot on. I think this, this goes across everything in relationships, love languages, all of this stuff. I think it's a give and take. If you, you're two people coming in and you have a hundred percent that needs to give to the relationship, sometimes you're going to give 70 and get 30. And sometimes you're going to take 70 and get 30 or anywhere in between. And you've just got to, that's the ebbs and flows of it. And I think people these days, they're too quick to walk away. I had, um, I had a dating coach on a couple of weeks ago. Um, and she was like, when you get together with someone, it shouldn't be, is this going to work? It should be, how do we make this work? And that stuck with me because I've actually, believe it or not, I've had that mindset for a long time where I'm, I'm slow to get into a relationship, but once I make that commitment, it's because I can actually see this going far and I want to put in the effort to make it go far. And I think it's, there's probably a little bit of like my childhood shit going on there too, where it's more like, oh, like a little bit of a fear of abandonment or not being able to, you know, be accepted and loved and all that stuff. But like, if people are going to enter in a relationship, I feel like you should have already identified if this person is someone you want to put the work in with, because it is going to be work. It is going to be hard and you've got to be committed to it because it's conflict is inevitable. And I'm not saying every relationship you go into is you got to make work because there are points when you, you know, you've said earlier, you've got to look at it and be like, okay, maybe this isn't working anymore, but have you exhausted everything that you can do as your partner given the same thing so that you're you're walking away from a perspective of okay like this actually is not we're not compatible long term right and i think people are too quick to walk away and and not communicate and then take offense to it and it just it ends a lot of relationships that maybe had uh people given a little bit more of themselves into it and been a little bit more flexible and given a little more space and been a better listener and been a better communicator those relationships could have gone uh you know uh become much stronger yeah, it's too quick to walk away. And then I, I hear a lot of other people, they're in a, a unfavorable situation, but I hear things like, mm. well, okay, it's not like not needs aren't being met. This isn't my person, but I don't want to have to start over. I don't want to have to get back on the apps. 
I'll just go through this with someone else, which you're shaking your head because I'm, when I hear that, I just, my heart Crazy. sinks and I'm like, huh, no, like there, there is so much more than this and you deserve so much better. And, and what about taking that time where you're, you're not dating anybody? Or, I mean, I've taken time where I'm like not dating anyone. I'm, I'm celibate and it's, there might be lonely times or sometimes you're like, yeah, I wish someone was here or whatever, but that time you or spent, that hug, I want that, that hug. <laughs> people, I, I have that too. And that, that was a COVID thing too, where I, I was, I remember Googling, like, can you die of hug starvation or something? Cause there were days it, it felt like that. And well, those and do release oxytocin into your body, which is the love chemical. And that's how parents and children bond when babies are born. It's being held. That's how they build that that bond because those chemicals are released while they're being held by their parent. Like that's the human connection piece. Like you need to, to have physical touch. You need to have important conversations and be vulnerable with each other because that's what literally teaches your body that you're connecting through the chemical release. Yeah. And, and so I, then like give yourself a hug or or go to a friend or go, you know, even I go to my, my net, my net meditation, meditation space. And the people there, I find that are also fellow meditators the people that work there. We'll, we'll give each other a hug, but I highly encourage everybody, whether you are so single or you're somewhere in between, or you're so married to take that time to develop that deeper relationship with yourself. It'll make you a much better partner. And I think so many get to the end of their life and, and, and they have no idea who they are underneath all, all the mm -hmm. labels that are placed on them or they place on themselves. And, and therefore they haven't really, I mean, I'm, I'm getting sad now thinking about some relatives that I've, I've tried to connect and they, they really just aren't they willing or, or able. And it's like, we're gonna we're gonna die and and have not really known who that person is on on any so it it breaks my heart but i'm learning too not to force anything with anyone and and go through that grief cycle and getting to that acceptance phase and sometimes you go through the cycle again and again um and just and and being okay okay that person whomever they are that we love mm -hmm. couldn't meet our needs and even if we think it's not okay it's okay but then doubling down on, on meeting our own needs. And when we do that, I promise you, it sounds like magic, but it isn't. You, you magically, miraculously meet people who I'm like, wow, this person is a way better friend to me in a week than this person I've known for 20 years. Like they care more about who I am and what I'm doing than these people I've known for years. And so that is the gift when you do it. But I think it's hard or scary for people because before they let go, they want to have the next thing lined up, whether it's the job, the best friend, yeah. the partner, but it doesn't always work like that. You kind of have to make space for, for all the new people to come in. And in that meantime, have that, that juicy self-connection. Yeah, I completely agree. I think people, I know in my experience, it wasn't until I kind of made that connection to myself that I felt like I was able to make progress with my mental health, with my physical health, with you know, feelings of loneliness and managing my depression and all of these things that really stifled me in my teenage years and my, even my childhood years, but like my teenage years and my twenties, all of these things were just that I did not have a connection with myself. I didn't know what I needed in a relationship. I didn't know what I needed in my career. I didn't know how to fill my cup. I didn't know how to set boundaries. I didn't know how to pick the right people to have in my life. And when, you, when you're when you in this situation, you feel like you're not in control of your life. And until you make that connection with yourself and you realize you're actually in control of a hell of a lot more than you think you are, that's when you can really start to have inner peace that allows you to identify what you need, eliminate things that disrupt that peace because they come in like a bull in a china shop and you're just like, whoa, that is... You know, that person a few months, years ago, before you, you made this connection with yourself, like that person would have come in and just destroyed your whole store. But now you're like, whoa, you're not welcome here. And that's OK. Right. But you got to you got to make that connection. I feel like within yourself before you're able to to really make it effectively with others. Are you willing to. <laughs> this is such a silly question. And I'm like, nah. I'm like immediately I'm like, no. But I'll ask you, are you willing to teach someone, a friend, a lover, a, a parent, a relative, a business colleague, how to properly communicate, how to connect? Or if they come in kind of at a two and you're at a eight, you're just like, 
this is going to, it's, it's, it's too much. I think, and you know, I've, I've done a little tiny bit of coaching here and there. Um, and I coach at work. And a lot of the things that I coach my team at work is to effectively communicate to the audience they're communicating to. Cause again, it's like this worldview. So for example, with marketing, I'll use because that's my area of expertise. I'll have a marketer on my team and he'll put together a beautiful presentation that talks about all the successes we've had. But like his audience doesn't know the acronyms, doesn't know what this stuff means, why it matters and all that stuff. So it's kind of like, um, you know, I'll, I'll give him the guy like if you're giving this to me, perfect. I understand every piece of lingo in here. But if you're giving it to the broader team or to an executive team that have never done marketing, like you've got to kind of like simplify it into layman's terms. Right. And I think that's the key to effective communication in everyday life as well. And I think that's actually what makes me a good marketer is that I can take something complex and put it into layman's terms. I think that's what makes me an effective communicator with the UCAN Foundation as well is because I can take this complex, you know, labor issues, exploitation, um, you know, mistreatment of people, ruining people's lives and like communicate it in a way that is authentic and can make people sit and be like, oh, I'm actually not okay with that. Right. That's why I can go talk to a, a MAGA Trump reporter and go talk to a communist and have meaningful conversations with them. So uh, but to your point is like when I do work with people on their communication, a lot of times it's by getting um, getting them to look at someone's intentions and not what they're actually saying or doing. And it's also helping people to step outside of the glasses that they're wearing in their worldview to realize that like most of the time, and there's, this is not always the case, but most of the time, even the person that's hurting you doesn't mean to hurt you. Mm. And so if in my experience, um, and I have a lot of experience with people, um, I would say hurting me, but not necessarily trying to hurt me, mm. um, you know, being able to kind of separate what's said or what's done versus what someone's intentions are or why they've taken that route has helped me become a better communicator. And I think if I can help people do that, they can connect with people a lot better. They can connect with themselves better. And then you can kind of disconnect yourself from all of the noise that is, you know, trying to invade your home, your home being like your mental health. Oh, it gets really noisy at times mm -hmm. and, and things, things linger and we fall off the path and I'm working. I, I have been so committed to my healing and, and, and blocking out the noise, whether it's the traffic or the sirens <laughs> or people knocking on your door unannounced or the yelling, the news, all of it. I think we all, mm. we all know what noise is at this, at this point. Yeah that and then how that can take us off our, our path, whether it's being focused on the task at hand or getting distracted or getting triggered. And, and so it is a practice like anything else. And um, I, I, gosh, I would love to do a whole series on this because it is so noisy out there and it's only getting noisier. And that's why I do the work that I do and then wrote the book that I wrote and want to have these conversations just so people can see themselves and us and what we're talking about. And then acknowledging it first. And yes, we can do whole shows on how to's and give them the tips and tricks. But first we got to talk about this stuff and even admit that that, that behavior bothers us. And rather than just mm -hmm. being like, it's fine, or I'm a nice girl, or I need to be more ladylike and not be upset about this or whatever it is to just, to really just be honest and, and start telling the truth first to ourselves, but, but to others, because even something that happened earlier, it's still I'm focused on, on you and I'm here present with you. And that stuff, as you know, it, it can linger in the brain mm -hmm. because you're still processing, you're still reflecting, we're done reacting, but now you're reflecting and processing. And you hear that part of your brain that says, just let it go or forgive that person or move on. But that other part that's like, mm, I'm still stinking mad or how are that, how's that person going to perceive me or how am I perceiving myself? And all these things come up and I think that's powerful because it's self-aware and when we acknowledge it, then we can take responsibility and do something about it. But how do you, how do you just, I don't want to say let it go. I think that's a really dismissive thing to say to anybody, including ourselves, but you were in such a noisy situation with the love is blind aftermath, especially 
how did you knock out the noise so that you didn't make some harmful decisions to your life? <laughs> you should save that for the ask me anything portion of the show. Um, well, I guess maybe we're in that, but maybe then we're, we're going to, oh. this is like, this is like that movie that the end is the beginning. <laughs> the beginning is the end. I'm still... <laughs> so that's a, no one's ever asked me that before. Um, and I can tell you that the aftermath was the hardest time of my life. And, um, you know, I just, I actually did an interview earlier today, which I think I mentioned to you, uh, with someone who's writing a book and there was this moment where, and it was the end of 2022 where I was like, I don't want to be here anymore. I, I can't, I can't do this. Like I, I felt, you know, you have as humans, we have this inherent belief that we need to be heard and our truth needs to be told and our experience needs to be shared, especially when you feel like you've been wronged or you've been misrepresented. Right. And that's how I was feeling there. And at just like the whole time from the show where there was pressure left, right, center, diagonal to change, to embrace the quote character that you are portrayed as. Now, I don't think I was portrayed as a character. I, I think I, was was uh portrayed very much accurately for the most part with a few exceptions of how people interpreted certain things but you can't control that but what it didn't do was it didn't show the whole person it didn't show the whole nick thompson it showed the caricature of a couple of things that are about me and then to kind of like embrace that and become that shell of a person or that shell of a persona that never seemed right to me. And I never fully stepped into that. Now, there are pieces of me, and this is, comes to like, kind of like social media posting too, where it's like, I don't give, I don't have a content calendar. I post when I have something to say or something to share. I don't care if I go weeks anymore. I don't care if I go months. I don't care if I share pictures of only my dog. If this bothers you, you have this magical thing called the unfollow button and <laughs> you can just click it and I don't give a shit. Um, I wish you well. I literally wish you well on your way and in your life. And I, I'm glad that I'm not going to bother you with my posts anymore. So when I was back there, there was more, and this is the whole thing on the show. It's always a pressure cooker to do something, to make the decision or to change. And a lot of people give in to one or all, and they, they embrace the character or they embrace the tagline or they embrace you know, the, the key word that's being pushed all over Reddit about them, right? They embrace it because there's money to be made, there's fame to be had, and there's uh, adoration and you're getting, you know, the dopamine hits and all of that. So when things were really bad in 2022, public divorce, lost my job, pretty much lost my will to continue and live in, in the world as it was, I was heartbroken. And a lot of people too, like watched, watched it on TV. So therefore, it wasn't real to them. It was a real marriage to me and mm. it was real love and it was a loss. It's a big loss. Mm. And um, I just remember feeling like everybody wanted me to spill the tea, to say what really happened. Like there was some sort of big scandal or something or, or, you know, slap, snap back about something that was said at me or threats that were being made. And like, you know, I just took it. I took it because of the stuff that I shared earlier, when there, when you feel the need to react, which is I need to react to defend myself. I need to react to protect my image. I need to react because this is, you know, ruining my life. Like I stop and I, I'm more proud of myself for this than anything in the world. And it's actually part of what got me through it is that I had the ability to, thanks to a lot of therapy and a lot of inner healing and self-work, I had the ability to stop myself from reacting, defending myself and know that like, this is not a representation of who I am. This is not truth. This is not my experience. And I don't care what my friends say I should do, what my family wants me to do, what the people in my life want me to do to react to this. I'm going to be responsive and I'm going to do it on my timeline. And if I do that, I'm not going to look back on this and say I acted out of character. I'm not going to look back on this and have regret. I'm not going to look back on this and say, man, I really wish I would have just done this, this or this and made this amount of money and just 
I'm not going to, because throughout this entire process, I've stayed true to myself, to my integrity, to my morals, and to, you know, my inherent belief system that if you do the right thing, your roads may be weaving a heck of a lot more than if you do the wrong thing, but your destination, and it may not be where you thought you were destined to go, but your destination is right where you're supposed to be. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I just, as hard as it was, and a lot of this is retrospect, but at the time I just was, I just kept telling myself, I'm like, this is not, it is not within your character to get in the mud with reality TV. It is just Ooh. not in your character. You have integrity, act with integrity, protect the, the people you care about, protect the people you love. Like you, I would get headlines. And let me tell you, there were times I'd wake up to like E! News emailed me, people emailed me and they're like, what do you have to say about this? And I just didn't respond. And I, I just, I don't have any, I, I don't want to do that. Like that's not in my character. That's not who I am. And I'm proud of myself probably more than anything in my life, which I used to be most proud of my career, but that's not it. it. It was this, it was at the moment of adversity in the worst moment of my life. Um, it went on for months and months. I stayed true to myself. And then not only that, but instead of being a victim, I turned it into something bigger than me. And I'm, I'm fighting for um, systemic change in, in reality TV because of the whole, ex my whole experience from start to finish and the experience of, you know, Danielle, that, that was a person that I love and making sure that like I do everything I can to make sure that those things don't happen to other people. So that's kind of how, but it's, it, it certainly wasn't easy. Those were the hardest, hardest, hardest times in my life. But I think the lesson that I took out of there is I'm resilient and I can take on anything after that. I'm hearing I'm unstoppable by Sia and what's coming up yes. for me that's making me <laughs> laugh. You know, when, when you talk about something and, and some people kind of understand, or you'll even say, hey, it really hurts me when you do this. And people say, well, give me an example. And I feel like <laughs> you, we just, we talked and talked and then about how we need to ask better questions, you get better answers. And we're talking about how to connect and how to communicate. <laughs> and I asked you a question that you said, no one's ever asked me that before. And so what did it do for you? You got to open up, you got to reflect and learn about yourself. I got to learn so much about you. And so now I feel more connected to you. I'm sure anybody listening feels more connected to you, your authentic you and your heart. And so in journalism, we show, we don't tell. So we're showing, not just telling. So it's so beautiful what just happened. And that was relatively easy. Granted, this is my background. I'm like a professional. No, I was going to say, you're like you really will. good. <laughs> and I, 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 Capturing I, the emotions. <laughs> It's that's my, we all have our gifts, right? There's plenty of things yeah. I, I am terrible at. So I think it's, that's a, a point too, is really, and I love it. This is my favorite thing to do and talk about. And I'm so lit up. And then you just see the impact that you're able to have on someone where they feel so seen and, and maybe stop asking questions that make us feel like all we are is what we do for a living. What do you do or, or Seriously. something like that? So, um, I'm sorry for, what you went through, but there was someone again, as the universe would have it, I saw it just yesterday and it's so perfect for this. It was, it's some billionaire. And instead of giving the, the, the business advice to that normal stuff you hear, he said something like, I wish you a lot of pain and suffering because that will teach you and give you resilience. And if you wanna become a billionaire or a success, whatever that is to you, resilience is the number one yes. thing that will get you there. And so, I'm excited to see where you go with your success because you got the beautiful gift of resilience through this, you know, upsetting time or, or challenging time. I, I appreciate that. And I, I'll say too, like, that's not, it's very hard for me to talk about that time just because um, one, I don't, it is my, like, I had a horrible experience. It's the worst time of my life. I should be allowed to talk about it, but I also don't want to start drama. Like I don't, I I'm not name calling, like it happened. The things that happened happened and I moved past them and I'm at peace and, and, um, you know, I, it doesn't invalidate it though. And so, you know, finding someone like you who can ask that question and give me the comfort to actually be answering it and be comfortable answering it because it, it is, it's a hard place to go back to. So I actually appreciate you being the person to ask me that as opposed to maybe someone else that I, I don't think um, 
I don't think I'd have anyone on here that had that would ask that question in bad faith, but you know, in a, in a less kind of like genuine way, mm. because they probably wouldn't have had a good answer or I would have said, no, not answer. Or, or you may <laughs> even, or I think the way that people sometimes ask anything, you can feel their judgment, even if that isn't their intention, but you, you mm. feel that underlying judgment or almost wanting you to act or, or speak out of character. But just where for me, it's always like, there's no right or wrong answers. And yes, you can say no, but it's just, it's that's a humanity in me. I, I think like, gosh, I, I I can only or can't even imagine because it is so public. And also, you know, we all have things that we can teach. I would love a teaching from you or, or a show about because something that I still struggle with that I don't even like to admit because I'm a grown ass woman. But I still and it's but I know where it comes from, from childhood and how I was raised and a nice Midwestern girl from Ohio and all of those things and what it means to be a nice girl that and I've seen Lady Gaga and Taylor Swift and all these superstars speak about this same thing. We're all like, you just need to be nice. And so all of us even and all of those huge celebrities have spoken about this. And then you see the, the change in their career where you can tell that they don't really care anymore and they're creating even better art. But even mm -hmm. I'm getting a little emotional talking about it. I still maybe worry or care what people think of me because at my core, I am a genuinely nice person. And when I act out of character, which I did before we hit record with the, the landlord showing up unannounced while I'm trying to record and I, and not being heard and having to raise my voice, I beat myself up about it. And I'm like, why do you care what this person who doesn't respect your boundaries thinks, for instance, or anybody, but I still do care. And I still, I have an issue with how I'm perceived and I hate even admitting it and I'm working through it. And maybe that's part of this show too, is an act of releasing that. But I also haven't been in your situation and you were able to even do it in that situation. Well, I, I want to, I have a question. I'm going to follow up with you on that. But before that, when I was, when I first decided that I was going to go on the show, when they cast me and I actually, up until the day before I was like, am I really doing this? I don't think I'm really doing this, but um, you know, my whole mindset was like, I don't really care what people think of me at this point because I act with integrity and I'm doing what I think is right. And so I'm not going to care what the internet says. I'm not going to care. And by and large, I didn't, <sighs> but there are moments where I had to for my relationship or I had to for, um, you know, cause people send you stuff and it's like, you're kind of like, you know, hit in the face with it sometimes. And for me, it was, I don't really care what people outside of my life think about me. So when people in my life would be like, Oh, like you were, you know, you were just you, but on TV or the people um, in my life when going through that bad time were reassuring instead of, you know, questioning um, or whatever it was. So what I think is a good takeaway from that, and then I have a question I want to ask you is what matter? It does, it's not that it doesn't matter what people say about you, but I do, I do believe by and large, like I say, I'm unapologetically myself, like, like me or hate me. I, I don't care. Like you have that decision. You can make that decision. I'm not going to try and force you to like me. I'm not going to try and force you to dislike me. I am who I am. I'm doing the best I can and I'm trying to get better. So if that's not your vibe, I'm not your vibe. So my question then to you is, do you concern, because you're a public figure, you're about to put yourself out there or you just put yourself out there by the time this comes out with your new podcast, you're doing real work, real journalism work, you're bringing real people and my guess is your circle of whether it's networking or professionals or friends, that's going to grow. But what that's going to do is that's going to grow with people who appreciate you and appreciate the work you're doing and appreciate your compassion and, and appreciate your empathy and your, your smart. So do you, and sorry, one last thought, but when you were broadcasting, I would imagine that your circle was big, but it's competitive. I've learned that from our friend Leverett. Mm -hmm. that it's very competitive in broadcasting. And so it's almost like you're not going to have those genuine same connections you get podcasting is my, my belief. But um, do you think, do you think it's because, or do you think it's possible that your struggles 
were because you were in this inauthentic industry on TV in front of a lot of people who can now, by the way, easily get upset by you and come send you a social media post or talk about you in the comment section without having, you know, like 20 years ago, they'd have to find a way to write you a letter, right? Like, so is it those strangers? Is it when people in your life or was, is it colleagues? Is there any trends there that you notice of the kind of people that you, you get upset if they don't like you or you don't please them? That was a long I, question. Sorry. No, it's it's good. And there's so many, there's so many layers to that. And I, so one thing that, that came to mind is when you are on, on TV, on, on any capacity in a certain way, and you know, this while you're still your authentic self. And for you, luckily there was a little, like you were same on and off camera and I am to a degree too, but on camera, you know, a, a, a lot of times I was like a bit more stoic because there's, there's words you can't say, you'll get sued, you'll get fired. For instance, there's so many things you can't say more and more now in this climate and culture. So you have to, you know, play this role. And as I, I like to say, I've, I'm the dog and pony show. You're the puppet, you're the personality more than the person. So, mm -hmm. and I think of my, my TV career, I, I received great feedback, nothing ever about my journalists mean ever. The comments I got, <laughs> really the only mean comments I've, I've gotten in my career, funny, funnily enough, were about, it's, it's like appearance and in particular, yeah. my hair. And I laugh because like I was a swimmer for 17 years, so my hair was jacked up. And then I've gone through all sorts of phases. My hair is very difficult. I think it looks great now, but only because it's professional. Looks great. Thank you. But it's like, you know, the texture was criticized, the cut, the cut, it was mainly the color. And all I thought was like, you're not even, you're dissing my colorist and I suck at hair and certainly never going to color it myself. So you're dissing my colorist, first of all, but just that that's what you choose to pick out. And now I think Nick, one of the number one compliments I get from strangers and friends alike is everyone loves my hair. I get more compliments on my hair than anything, which is ironic because that's what I was always criticized for. So I think maybe what I'm, I'm speaking to now is that when I'm now just fully, cause I've done the work showing up as Kate, the person yes. more so than Kate, the personality. And I'm talking about really, really personal topics that even friends or family members have never heard or don't know anything about. And I'm sharing it, not just privately with you, um, in a zoom or something, or even at dinner, but sharing it where anyone in the world could click and listen to it and crying and breaking down and talking about things where I'm, I could be judged or maybe someone won't work with me or date me because of something, but being like, okay, like you said, those aren't my people. So I'm kind of coaching myself in the moment. Those aren't my people. And thinking about the people, whether it's one person or 1 million people who hear what I've shared that I like am scared for the episode to even come out, but hear what I've said and they're able to do something positive with their lives, even if it's just like feel emotion deeply mm -hmm. and then make a change from that feeling, then I've done my job and that's why I'm doing it. So as I say that, now I'm in a place of like, I don't care, or this person may not like me or hate my hair or hate whatever, or say all the blonde, pretty, white privilege stuff. Yeah, guess what? I think it's that thing too, when you know who you are, no one can ever say anything. It's like, yeah, I am white. Thank you for thinking I'm pretty. I am blonde. And I am privileged. What else do you got? What else? What else do you got? You know well, what I by mean? The way, by the way, you, you got a lottery on the white part and the pretty part. And you could have that. That's the thing. Yeah. I, I agree with the privilege stuff uh, to an extent. But at the same time, like we're not choosing, choosing uh, before we come into this world or conceived what we do. But whatever. I even brought that up, but those are- No, 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 but it's a good yeah. point. I, those are things yeah. that I hear. And then I'm like, am I supposed to be offended by this? Am I supposed to not like my race? Am I supposed to feel bad about what other white folks are doing that is racist? Mm -hmm. You know, and so for me, I just know that it, we all have our different life assignments in our own activism work. And for me, mine is more in the suicide prevention and mental health arena. That's a huge life assignment based on my personal experience where, and, and, and certainly doing all my work on um, how to be non-racist and all that. But in terms of like doing activism around racism and DEI, that isn't my assignment. There's a, so mm -hmm. we can't be like, we can't take on every issue and, and I'm not going to try. And as I, I remember writing a, a, a article and it was about um, African-American um, people and, and that whole topic. 
And, you know, there was lots of comments and feedback there, a lot of positive. And some people said things. I feel like the negative comments there, there was one man who said, but what about the Native Americans, Kate? They were the first ones, blah, 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 blah. And so, and I was so proud of myself because I didn't get triggered. I didn't get upset. Mm -hmm. I, and I, I hit respond and I said his name, whatever his name was. And I said, what a great article for you to write. And so I just put it back on, on people. <laughs> like, oh my, you're clearly passionate about this. Like what? And I said, please. And I did that too. And I was genuine and it was kind to a bunch of people. And I said, oh my gosh, I would love to see an article on that. Please tag me or send it to me when it's published. Because those people that are writing the comments for the most part are not writing articles. No. They're not putting themselves out there to be ridiculed. They're just doing the ridiculing. They're keyboard activists and those aren't that helpful. They're not that helpful. But I, I, I think that's, first of all, brava, epic response. That's that's great. I love that. Um, so I want to, before we wrap up here, we, we're all out of order, but I, I want to go back to my question that I want to ask people, because I think this is a good way for us to to hear about the work you're doing now. Um, what did you want to be when you were a, a young person? And how did that change and lead you to where you are now, where your activism around suicide prevention, mental health, uh, you're coaching, you're speaking, you're a uh, published author, all of these wonderful things you've been able to do. And you even ended up leaving broadcasting to do some of this. So um, not to mention the podcast. So tell me, tell me a little bit about what you want to be when you grow up and how you got here. I love this question for so many reasons, because you look at what you see, the case in point, you ask a great question, I haven't even answered and I'm already smiling. And because <laughs> A, you took me back to childhood and that nostalgic feeling and I'm in my mind that like seven year old in my parents' living room watching the TV, which leads me to what I wanted to be when I grow up, which is Tom Brokaw. <laughs> 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 and so Tom That's was, a first. I love it. <laughs> yes. And so I should say, and it's Tom, because another the other person who was on the TV every night locally was this is funny and I didn't want to be him. Some way I I knew Tom was the better selection, was <laughs> Jerry Springer. Because I grew up in <laughs> opposite, <laughs> but total not, opposite, but not the Jerry Springer that you're thinking of. And many are thinking of when I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio, our main news anchor on NBC was Jerry Springer. And he at one point was also our mayor. So Jerry Springer to me was the local Tom Brokaw. This is before he became the Jerry Springer show with all the nonsense. And um, what I think a lot of people don't know about Jerry is that he's brilliant and he did his jerry springer commentary every night and even if as a kid i didn't understand everything he was talking about i remember being riveted like this guy knows his stuff and he's he speaks in such a compelling way as did tom so little kate is looking at this and i'm just like oh like they're telling us what's going on and i'm glad that my seven-year-old brain wasn't taking in all that violence because I'm not traumatized. Seriously. Like I'm just, I'm thinking of stories. And so I'm like, oh, they're telling us stories and oh, they're telling us what's going on other places besides just Ohio. How neat. Oh, here's what's going on. Oh, that seems sad. And then I would go up to my bedroom so inspired and I would read the news to my stuffed animals. I'd line them all up <laughs> and so I had cute. no no script or teleprompter no, nothing, just with my imagination. See, in my generation, we weren't, we didn't have devices. We we went and talked to our stuffed animals instead of getting on a iPad. Me too. Um, but I would just make up whatever news I had and tell my stuffed animals. And I I just loved that. And so that's what I, you know, I, I have done a bunch of things, but ultimately I was my own version of Tom Brokaw. And when I was working at NBC2 and Fort Myers, Florida, I got to go see Tom Brokaw speak at an event. Oh. And it was just this beautiful full circle moment. And the main anchor at my station interviewed him. And it was just, it was, it was cool. And so um I, I really like that to do that. But then the fact that I've I've done other things too, because like a relationship that's run its course, um, the, the TV news business kind of ran its course for me. Mm. And um, I, I was not able or willing, I guess, to become desensitized to all the horrific things going on and, and the climate. And so then I went and started selling beauty, beauty products on QVC all over the world and have gone on to do all these other things we've mentioned. But um, I forget the second part of your question. Um, just yeah. how did it lead you to what you're doing now? Oh, yeah. I, I think it's just that it's um, 
And I, it brings up that quote, I don't know who said it, but that nothing is wasted. And I think that's a great mm. theme in our conversation too, and the things that you've been through and what you've learned and how you've grown because you've chosen that. You've chosen to be a victor, not a victim. You've chosen to become resilient and use it as a catalyst for great transformation. So for me, I'm a, I'm a, a journalist and a storyteller at heart. I've always been so curious. I've always been a humanitarian. I'm even the humanitarian of the Zodiac as an Aquarius. I've always just been so fascinated by people and who they are and why they do what they do. That's the psych I've studied psychology as a mm. minor in college. So I'm just, I know and truly believe everyone has a story, um, however happy or sad, however complex, and that these stories need to be shared, whether you're a celebrity. I think more importantly, if you aren't a celebrity, I think that's, and those are the people yeah. I wanna talk to and have on my show as well, because everyone has some wisdom and, and some lessons to share that have transformed their lives that we can take. And so, yeah, just with the, doing the pot and then the coaching, I, again, I'm getting on with people, I'm asking them questions to help them heal and grow and, and perform and, and lead and feel confident and, and become successful, whatever that is for them. So it's just, it's all intertwined, all of our experiences. I think it's good to try different things. And I'm, I'm grateful I've done that. You know, there's been setbacks and obstacles and opposition, but it's-, it's Every step of the way, especially when you're trying to do something good. Of the way. And it, it, it kind of, the last thing I'll say about that is I was privileged enough to go see John Legend perform at the Greek theater a week ago. And I didn't know anything about the show. Of course, he's, it was a one-man show. Of course, he's a brilliant musician, played piano, sang. In between each song, he did the most prolific storytelling that was just so epic. I learned so much about him. And so what that did was I felt more connected, made me love him and his music even more. When I hear his th songs, I now think about that. But he said something at the end about, you know, um, cause everyone I think is trying to like be cool or make it. And here he was this self-proclaimed nerd then like <laughs> meeting and working with these hip hop superstars like Lauren Hill and Kanye West. He's this kid from like nothing in Ohio that's at this Ivy league school, UPenn. And he said, you know, what I learned is that being cool is the ability to just be who you are in any situation. Even if you're the nerd with Kanye West, you're the poor kid from No Place, Ohio at UPenn with all these rich Ivy League kids or whatever. And got I just, right, beautiful. me too. I just got goosebumps too. And then the last thing he said that really pertains to things that we've been through is he said, because he did, he went through a lot. He even got, he got rejected by these record labels, which mm. it's like, who rejects? Trump? But so a good message for all of us. But he talked about that, the things that he'd been through, because you and I, you know, and everyone listening, I'm sure we've gone through some painful things recently. And sometimes you are like, why? And it, it doesn't make sense and it hurts. But he said, you know, all of the pain and everything I've been through, I, I wouldn't change it because it made me who I am today. And I think about that. I actually feel a little sorry for people who haven't been anything, be, been through anything because they don't have the depth that, you know, you the get when you go through yeah. some shit. <laughs> You're so, so yeah. right. Thank you for that question. It was fun just to even reflect. And I went on a little journalistic journey. Just no, that was a phenomenal, that. that was phenomenal. That was a phenomenal story. And even tying it into the, the John Legend piece, that's, it's a perfect bow, right? Like be yourself. That's being cool. And those, I think too, like the broken parts are the beautiful parts because you, you fix them. Right. And then that's resilience. And I always say, you know, life is peaks and valleys. When you're in a valley, set up a campsite. Don't set up property. Don't buy property. Don't get a mortgage. Just Ooh. know you're staying there for a little bit of time and then you're heading back up on a peak. And I think that this, you know, to quote Papa Roach, <laughs> the scars remind us that the past is real. And I, I, that's, you know, one of my favorite songs growing up. And that's the, the thing is like, we have to come out on top. We have to conquer we have to to show up with our eyes wide open, be rawish, you know? So it, it it's all part of it. And the worst things in the world that happen to people only help shape the human being they're supposed to become and that they will become. And you can let that be a good human being or a bad human being, but that's yeah. your choice. And that you have a choice. How great is that? 
beautiful. So that's awesome. Well, this has been outstanding. I have a feeling at the very, very least, we'll probably you'll probably be back as a guest again at some point at the very least, but I would love to, to chat more about some other stuff, but tell me, uh, or tell me, tell the guests, where can everyone find you, find your podcast and, uh, find you on your website for potential coaching? Yeah. So it's the Raj podcast. It's really everywhere that you can listen. And then it's YouTube as well. Everything's Kate Ekman, K-A-T-E-E-C-K-M-A-N. And that's my website, kateekman.tv. Literally everything is there for social media, podcasts, coaching, speaking, anything you want to do. I would love to stay connected since that's our, our theme here and, um, and reach out. I think it would be fun if we did a a, a live show sometime and took questions because and really create that sort of community of connection and and proper communication and a sort of fun communication because I can hear and feel all the questions right now and I really can feel and I thank everyone for for listening especially here um, at this point um, I can feel feel people's hearts right now kind of expanding and and people not just thinking but but really feeling and um, starting to look at things differently or feel differently. Mm -hmm. And, um, I'm just so grateful for you and, and your skills. You're just, you're a, you got your Tom Brokaw on you too. So I, <laughs> I, I thank you, my friend. It's just, it's really, um, it's really a testament to the work that you've done and your, and your character. And thank you for not giving up and just coming back even more fierce and ferocious and, and ready to help heal and uplift the world. It's really inspiring. You're too kind. I, I appreciate you saying that, though. And I also want to add all those links you spelled out. Those are going to be down in the show notes so people can just click on click, follow, like, read, whatever they want to do. Um, book, podcast, website, Instagram, uh, LinkedIn, I think I threw down there as well. So uh, people can connect with you. And thanks again so much for doing this. This has been wonderful. Thank you. I appreciate you. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode of Eyes Wide Open. If you enjoy the show, the best way to support us is by sharing or dropping a review. For more information and content, check out engagewithnick.com or find me on Instagram at nthompson513. Don't go through life blind. Do the work so you can show up in the world with your eyes wide open.